Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Mind Shift Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Clint Haycock. I'm your fellow traveler along this road of deconstruction and discovery. And the aim of this podcast is to help you to think critically about such things as God, religion, the church, spirituality. And today we're going to be diving into the world of Karen Garst, the faithless feminist. If you've been following me for a while, you'll know that she was on the podcast last year. We did a couple of episodes on her previous book. Well, she contacted me a couple of months ago, and she told me that she's coming out with a new book on the 1st of June. It's called Women v. Religion, The Case Against Faith and for Freedom. And if you're interested in ordering a copy, you can actually order an advanced copy through Amazon even now. So take a look at that. In fact, she sent me an advanced copy of the book a couple of weeks ago, and I've started reading through it, and I'm telling you right now, it is an amazing book. What the book is about is basically it is a series of essays that examines one aspect of the impact of the three Abrahamic religions on women. So she's describing the impact of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam how they have treated women both historically as well as currently. And as I say, I started reading through the first chapter already, and it's an amazing book. Now, one of the great things that came out of this discussion with Karen about her new book coming out is she put me in touch with two of the women who wrote essays for the book, Valerie Wade and Deanna Adams. And it is my pleasure to bring you today the first conversation with Valerie Wade, and then next week, We're going to have Deanna Adams come in, and then following those two, we're going to bring Karen Garst back in, and she's going to talk about the book as a whole, and we're going to get into a lot of things specifically related to these three religions and their impact in terms of the treatment of women. So for the next three weeks, we're going to be diving back into the world of the faithless feminist and specifically focusing for these next two weeks on the African-American female perspective. I'll just mention at this point that there's a couple of different ways that you can get a hold of me on social media. Probably the easiest way is to follow me on Twitter at MindShift2018. And I'll put the other links to my other social media contacts in the show notes. I'm also going to put Valerie Wade's contact information there. So if you want to talk to her about any of the issues that come up from this episode, you can take a look in the show notes to find out how to get a hold of Valerie. I'll also just mention that if you found the content of MindShift Podcast helpful to you or stimulating, challenging in terms of this area of critical thinking, you can be a patron of the show For as little as $1 a month, you can go to patreon.com forward slash mindshift podcast and find out what it means to be a sponsor of this show. Help me to cover my monthly expenses to bring you this show each and every Friday. You'll also find out how you can become a member of the closed Mindshift podcast Facebook group, which is one of the rewards for being a sponsor of this show. Now, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking to Valerie and Deanna in the next two weeks. And what's interesting about this whole conversation is that, as I mentioned, both of them are African-American women. And this is the beauty of listening to a couple of episodes like this, is that I'm providing you the opportunity to sit down at that metaphorical table, so to speak, and listen to the stories of two women who come from a very unique point of view. They're both incredibly intelligent and articulate, and of course, they have this burden not only as women just generally, but as African Americans, they're bringing this issue to the table of not just how African Americans have been treated in American society generally, but they get more specifically focused on how African American women have been treated, and most specifically how African American women have been treated within the African American church, and how all of that somehow connects to the history of the slave trade and the things that came out of African American people being introduced to the white man's religion, so to speak, and how that complex blend of cultures that collided in religion still affects the African American community and the church and women today. And this is what Valerie and I are going to get into in just a few minutes. Now, I've been doing a lot of research on this subject, and I thought it might be helpful before we talk to Valerie to look at some definitions 
to kind of clarify what it is we're talking about. Because when we look at American society, it's long been known, that is in terms of sociologists anyway, as well as many people of color, that America is a society that's characterized by what they call systemic racism. And the word systemic is something that means it's all pervasive. It affects virtually every part of the nation at every level of society, all the way from the top down. I mean, for example, take a look at our American president, Donald Trump. Going back to the Obama birther stuff, he's known as a racist. He said things about Mexicans being rapists. So, you know, he's promoted racial stereotypes. He's a racist. And I suppose what's perhaps most shocking about the whole thing is not just that he's a racist, but that a large majority of white so-called evangelical Christians, that 81% or so, actually voted for this guy and apparently have no problem with him being a racist. And so what does that say about American society? In a way, it perhaps merely reveals what was already there. It's not something that's new. It actually just shines a light on something that was already there, this sort of inherent racist undertone. And really, the entire society is affected by racism, and it's there. You just have to learn to begin to see it. Now, where did this concept of systemic racism come from? Well, it was developed by sociologist Joe Fagan in his book, Racist America, Roots, Current Realities, and Future Reparations. And we'll circle around to Fagan's book in just a minute, but One of the things that I learned about was I found an article on ThoughtCo.com by Nikki Lisa Cole. And what she does is she provides a really helpful overview of this subject. And her article is titled Definition of Systemic Racism in Sociology. And she says, quote, systemic racism, she's talking about in American culture, she says it is both a theoretical concept and a reality. As a theory, she says, it is premised on the research-supported claim that the United States was founded as a racist society, that racism is thus embedded in all social institutions, structures, and social relations within our society. And she concludes by saying, Rooted in a racist foundation, systemic racism today is composed of intersecting, overlapping, and codependent racist institutions, policies, practices, ideas, and behaviors that give an unjust amount of resources, rights, and power to white people while denying them to people of color, end quote. Now, you might be sitting there going, wait a minute, wait a minute, America is not founded as a racist society, that's not right. But the truth is, when you look at the history It was founded as a racist society on the basis of undeserved enrichment of white people by the labor of black slaves, which, of course, in turn has led to the undeserved impoverishment of people of color. And, of course, there's been a long history of the exploitation of black labor by Europeans and Americans alike. And Nikki Cole comments on this. She says, quote, These historical practices created a social system that had racist economic inequality built into its foundation. End quote, which, of course, is perpetuated by white elites, whether consciously or unconsciously. Take a look at this, for example. White people make up the majority of Congress, university and college leaders, top management of corporations, representing cultural, economic and social power in American society, which then in turn leads to the routine discrimination of people of color in virtually all all areas of life. We're talking about marginalization and dehumanization. Now, I mentioned a minute ago Joe Fagan's book, Racist America, and on this subject, he says, quote, systemic racism includes the complex array of anti-black practices, the unjustly gained political economic power of whites, the continuing economic and other resource inequalities along racial lines, and the white racist ideologies and attitudes created to maintain and rationalize white privilege and power. And Fagan goes on to say, Systemic here means that the core racist realities are manifested in each of society's major parts. He concludes by saying, Each major part of U.S. society, the economy, politics, education, religion, the family, reflects the fundamental reality of systemic racism, end quote. And this is just one of the reasons why it's important to sit down with someone like Valerie Wade and next week with Deanna Adams, because as African Americans, as African American women, they can bring a knowledgeable voice to the table and articulate the struggles that they've had in in not just their own lives personally and in terms of their experiences with the African American church. But what I love about Valerie is that she's a historian. She brings to the table an expertise. So we're going to talk about sort of the period from 
the pre-Civil War restoration Jim Crow laws and bring that up to about the time of the early Civil Rights Movement. And next week, Deanna and I are going to get into that. That's kind of her specialty. She starts with the Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s, early 1960s, and brings it up to today. So I invite you to pull your chair up to that table. Let's hear what Valerie Wade has to say as she talks about black women and Christianity in the United States. I am happy to be joined here with Valerie Wade. Thank you, Valerie, for joining me on MindShift Podcast. Thank you for having me. How are you doing? I am doing great. I've just gotten back from a nice holiday. We spent a week in Portugal, so we came back to cold and rainy Britain. But uh, I'm not bitter at all. <laughs> That's the problem with going on vacation somewhere where it's nice and warm, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I'm in Houston, Texas, and um, I can't complain. It's, it's actually nice this time of year. In a couple of months, it'll be too hot to go outside, but for now, it's really nice. <laughs> you can't complain too much. You're in the great state of Texas, and we met through Karen Garst. Because, as yes. I understand it, you and Deanna, who's going to be on the podcast next week, you helped write a chapter with her. You, you Did you both collaborate on this chapter together? In some ways, yes. Both of our chapters sort of work together. So my chapter focuses on some of the earlier experiences that African American women have had with the church. And then Deanna's chapter focuses on more recent and current experiences. Right. So we're going to go back into history. But before we do that, I'm really interested to hear your story because we talked the other week. We had a great pre-interview conversation, and you're obviously a, you're a historian, so you're a fan of history like me. I'm interested <laughs> to find out what's your own personal story, though, before we get into the history of, of the African-American women preachers and kind of moving that into modern day. What's your story? Because you obviously, you spent time in church as well yourself, didn't you? Yes, I grew up in a Baptist family. Uh, most of my family stems from Texas and Louisiana. A lot of the older men in my family were preachers and deacons, so that was just a big part of my upbringing. But my mom was a little different. She sort of floated between churches for a while when uh, my sisters and I were growing up. So we went to Baptist churches in addition to Church of God in Christ or Kojic churches. We went to apostolic churches and Church of Christ uh, denominations. So we sort of attended a lot of different um, churches across the board there in our small town in Texas. And we had some good experiences, um, but I also had some not good experiences. And I think those things have shaped me as an adult. Yeah, how have they shaped you? Because you have a real passion for wanting to hear women, and not just women, but African-American women preaching and in leadership roles. What what was your church experiences that kind of shaped you into having this passion for such a subject and a desire today? Yeah, so my church experiences were for the most part pretty conservative as far as women in leadership went. And basically that means that I grew up in churches where women were not permitted to preach. They were not ordained to lead churches that was considered a sin for women um, to get up and lead. I remember one of my earliest church experiences, it was after service, and I was sort of playing with my cousins, and we were just sort of running around a little bit, not really doing anything, but um, I got too close to the pulpit, and one of the elders in the church said, oh, no, you don't go up there. You're a girl. You can't play in the pulpit. And, you know, as a six- or seven-year-old, you just sort of continue with what you're doing, but later I thought about it. It's like, wow, women really can't even be in that space. Yeah, quite literally. Um, because it's only reserved for men. It's that ingrained. So that sort of followed me all through my life, just seeing the ways that people talked about women and marriage and relationships um, in the church. That sort of left a mark on me. Do you find that it's particularly pronounced in the African-American community? Because obviously the issue of women in ministry, women in leadership across the board is a huge problem no matter what uh, ethnic group you're looking at. Do you find that it's more pronounced in the African American church, would you say, or? That was hard for me to answer. I, because I don't have a lot of experience in non African American churches. I attended the Unitarian Universalist Church for a long time throughout college and, um, my early twenties. 
Um, so I, I don't know that I have enough experience to really make a strong statement on whether it's more pronounced in African American churches, but I will say that it is pretty pronounced. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, if there was some objective data and, and studies that show that it's more pronounced. Um, I just can't say for sure from personal experience, but it's definitely a hot button issue. You identify yourself as someone who grew up in a fairly conservative background. Where are you at currently? Where would you say, what, how would you describe yourself in terms of your current beliefs? Are you still involved in the church at all? No, not really. <laughs> not at all? I, I'll go for, you know, family events, you know, for, you know, little cousins and nieces and nephews getting baptized or if they're having, if they're giving their Christmas speeches, you know, I'll go to support them and things like that. Um, but my own personal beliefs, I call myself sort of a cultural Christian, Christian or um, an agnostic atheist, which I know sounds a little weird. But to me, that is a way for me to acknowledge the background that I grew up in, to acknowledge the faith tradition of my grandmothers and great grandmothers and so on and so forth. I don't want to completely discard that. But I also want to leave space for my own thinking, my own logic, and free thought. So um, culturally, yeah, Christian. I like Christmas trees and Easter egg hunts. <laughs> yeah, those are but fun. I don't get caught up in um, all those things like, you know, the Immaculate Conception and the Resurrection and things like that. I just try to use the good things that came from Jesus' ministry. I mean, he seemed like a, a pretty decent guy, you know, <laughs> healing the poor and whatnot. So I think that there are good things that we can take from that. But as far as getting caught up in all the organized religion and the doctrine and stuff like that, that's not really me. That doesn't describe you at all. What What was you, your pro, your process of deconstruction? How did you, what what led you away from this mainstream churches that you grew up in? I mean, you, you sound like you were almost in it from kind of day one. What led you away from it? Was, was part of it this issue of the way you felt the, the church was treating African-American women? Yes, it was the misogyny and the sexism, definitely. As I got into my teens, I really became uncomfortable with it, but I couldn't do much about it because, of course, I you know, still lived at home. And the homophobia and the anti-intellectualism that I encountered in the church growing up, all those things, you know, they just I just really didn't like it. I didn't think it was fair. I didn't think that a God who felt the way that it was presented in the churches that I grew up in, I was like, I don't think I really like this guy. <laughs> it doesn't sound like somebody that I want to worship. So when I left home, for college, that's when I really started to sort of explore different faith traditions and just started trying to fill things out and figure things out on my own. And so now that I'm, you know, an adult, I've been gone from home for a while. I'm not trying to, you know, bash churches or say, you know, down with all religion or anything. It's not like that. I went through a phase <laughs> where, I was, where I felt that way, but I'm not, um, not quite in that space anymore. But I do want us to question the role that the church has in the community. And that's sort of how I try to live. I try to live a life of kindness and and uh, service. Yeah, I mean, if a church does not fit with that, then it's just not for me. And unfortunately, a lot of traditional churches, that's not their focus. Their focus is sort of follow the rules, look down on other people, so on and so forth. And it's just not me. It's not you. Yeah, it's quite interesting, isn't it, that you describe this kind of journey away from the church there's there's some values that you resonate with, it sounds like, but in general, yeah, if it's all about keeping rules and especially homophobia, misogyny, oppression of women, you don't want to have anything to do with it, really, then. No, not at all. <laughs> no. Now, what's That's your interest true. in in the historical side of things? Because you, you're a historian, and mm -hmm. we talk, when we were talking the other day, your, your kind of specialty period, what would you describe it as, sort of like, mid early 1800s up to about the early 19th century what what's kind of your time frame and what's your interest in that period so my research interests pretty much lie in the early 1800s to about the early 1900s so i focus on um the early american republic so roughly the revolutionary war on up through the Civil War, up through Reconstruction in the 1880s, on up through the Jim Crow era in the early 1900s. And I pretty much 
sort of cut things off about World War Two. So anything after that, you know, I'm interested in it, but that's a little too modern for me. <laughs> right. We'll leave that to Deanna to pick that up. She's more into yeah. the modern history. But now, why is it why is it so important, though, from your point of view as a historian, to study that time period? I mean, I'm saying that as a as a fan of history, I love history, but I want to set you up with a nice, good question. You know, why is it so important to study that time period? I think it's important to understand that time period because we take too many things for granted about the earlier decades, uh, at least, you know, as far as American history goes. There's a lot of assumptions that we make that really aren't quite true. And so for me, trying to understand how we got to where we are now as a community, as a country, for me, it's just important to go back and say, wait, how did we get here? What went on? Um, what do we think we know that we don't know? And particularly as a black American woman, it's just interesting for me to understand how black American as an identity became a thing. How did it come to exist? Because up until, you know, colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade, it wasn't, <laughs> it was not in existence. We were in Africa and we had completely different tribal and ethnic identities. So it's just a way for me to try to build those connections and really get to some truths that I think are important today. It's certainly a narrative that white Western Americans would not pro probably be that familiar with, would they? Maybe in general outlines, they obviously know the story of slavery, as you say, or at least are aware of it. But how do you feel that as an African American, that's a different perspective? You know, you're saying this is the story that maybe hasn't been told or hasn't been understood. What are some of these important things that you've uncovered in your study of this time period? Well, one thing that is really important to me is seeing how enslaved people, even with all of the things that they were going through, like the mental and, and physical torture that they went through, how they sort of maintained cultural connection with their ancestors in Africa. Uh, for a long time, historians felt that they sort of forgot everything, left everything as soon as they got off those slave ships and landed here. But that's false. There were lots of connections, and I talk about that in my article in the book. But for me, just as a historian, it's just interesting, like, going back and being able to sort of trace and piece together these things, because it's important. We do have a history. We do have a culture. Our ancestors did not just sort of give up, so to speak, and accept their fate. They fought in the small ways that they could, and one of those methods for resistance was culture and faith and religion. And so I try to give respect to that. All these people from different parts of Africa, different tribes are kind of jammed together, aren't they? And mm -hmm. and therefore, how do they maintain their own unique cultures and, and, and identity in this horrible time, this horrible context? And then somehow this Christian religion is introduced into the mix as well, isn't it? By the white slave owners in many ways. And, and it, it's mm -hmm. fascinating to me. I don't know enough about it. And that's why I'm interested to talk to you because how does how does that whole piece come together where you have your own African tribal traditions and cultural traditions and then it's injected in with this sort of white western Christianity how did that mix come together and then what was the result in what we have today in African American churches what is the thread do you tr trace that thread on through even into today's churches yes I mean there are definitely some traditions and things that you can trace back. Um, but that introduction of white Western Christianity is a really important piece in this conversation when we're trying to understand the relationship between Black American women and the church. One thing I do want to point out is that Christianity existed in Africa even before the slave trade really picked up. Um, if you go back um, to Ethiopia, there are ancient artifacts, paintings, texts that show that Christianity had sort of taken on there. Yeah, the Coptic so, Church in Ethiopia. Yes, exactly. So there's a distinct sort of white Western Christianity that was used to justify the slave trade that is not necessarily representative of all Christianity across the world. So I, sometimes I just want people to understand that we're talking about like a specific sort of cultural violence, like the people using the Bible to justify all of these horrible things that were happening. That just takes so much to unpack, you know, because, of course, you know, Jesus did not teach 
a religion or a faith of violence and subjugation and rape and and evil and separating mothers from children and all of that. But somehow, (laughs) you know, the Bible became a tool for supporting that system. So you have enslaved people um, trying to survive in this new world in the United States. They are um, in situations where if they do try to practice their ancestral faith, they often are met with punishment. So there are lots of documents that show how drumming was banned, for instance. They weren't allowed to speak their native languages. They had to speak English. So you you have this situation where they have to make the best of a really bad situation. What they did was what we call religious syncretism. They sort of blended Christianity, uh, the brand of Christianity that was sort of forced on them, with the faith traditions of their ancestors. You know, and that you see those threads in gospel music, some of the phrasing in very old black hymns, the repetition, things like that. Those are things that they sort of, they mixed with their African um, cultural tradition. Um, now we see it as purely Christian, you know, we see it as gospel music, but those threads are there. So just as a historian, I just I just think it's important to reach back and try to understand things like that. I'm not sure if that makes sense. I know I'm kind of going all over the place, but I'm just trying to articulate that. Although the way that Christianity was introduced to enslaved people, I think that it's more nuanced than just, oh, it's, it's good or bad. They, they really did the best that they could with what they were given. It's virtually impossible today to try to understand what it could, what it must have been like. You can read accounts and see movies like Amistad and things like that, and it's just unbelievable. But you're right, these, these songs is a good example, isn't it, of the, the Negro spirituals or whatever you call them. We were talking, I think, the other day about the song, We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder. And this is a song that I used to sing in church when I was a kid. And I recently found out that that came from that time, wasn't it? A, it was a song that they would sing in the fields. And these were some of the ways that they that they just were able to cope, seeing religion, seeing Christianity as a way to climb the ladder out of their terrible situation into heaven, as it were, to escape. Even if they knew they couldn't physically escape, they could maybe spiritually escape from these terrible conditions. Yes, exactly, exactly. It was, you know, they coped the best that they could. Um, And there are, you know, good and bad results of that. You know, the sexism that we're seeing in the church is a bad result of some of that. They took on some of these really negative ideas about women and the role of women in society. And, you know, we're still sort of trying to disentangle ourselves from that. Yes, we've um, got these cultural but entanglements. Worse, you know, that faith helped them persevere. I wouldn't be sitting here today if they just gave up. So I can't just completely you know, disregard, you know, what they did to survive uh, faith-wise and religion-wise. As an African-American, what I hear you saying is that's such an important part of your your backstory and your history. You don't want to just discard it out of hand, even though you may not believe necessarily all the classic sort of orthodox Christianity things, the fundamentalists that they would say you have to believe X, Y, and Z to be a Christian. It's more of a cultural thing. You said you were a cultural Christian. I think you identified yes. yourself as a cultural Christian. Yes, exactly. Exactly. That's what I mean. And I know everybody approaches, you know, that differently. There's lots of, you know, black women who are like, you know, they don't want anything to do with it, period. You know, that's, and I completely understand. I get it. You know, it's just for me. And I think it's just, as a historian, it's, it's hard for me to just completely. Yeah, throw the know, baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> yeah, it's too much part of the there, culture. But, um, yeah. Now, there are, though, examples of African-American women preachers, and I think this is kind of your specialty as well, isn't it? During some of these time periods, there are some notable examples of African-American women who did preach. So are those important to talk about? They must be important to talk about, especially in our conversation around what you think should happen maybe today. Can you tell us about some of these uh, famous African-American preachers, these women? Yes. So one thing that I love about studying history is that um, you you can't make assumptions, as I said before. So growing up, you sort of get this idea that, oh, women must have just sat down and, and just took this treatment, and they must have never preached. Um, I mean, if that's the rule, then I guess they follow the rule, because I've never heard of any women preachers. You know, that's sort of the logic growing up. But as I started 
getting deeper into my career and my research interests, I came across women like Jarena Lee, who was one of the first black women preachers who actually recorded. Now, there may have been women before her who preached as far as, you know, the documentary history shows. She was the first woman authorized to preach in the AME Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And this happened around either 1816 or 1819. Things are, some documents tell different stories, but um, it was in the early 1800s. And at first, Richard Allen who was the founder of the AME Church, at first he wouldn't allow her to preach, but eventually he did. So she she didn't have an easy time of it. I can um, imagine. But yeah, this was in the early 1800s. Jerina Lee was, was making moves in the uh, in the AME Church. And um, other women like Julia Foote, uh, she came a little bit later. Let's see. Um, I'm trying to be sure I get my dates right. She preached in the AME Zion Church, and she faced a lot of discrimination as well, but she came a little bit later than Jarena Lee. She was born um, in 1823 in New York. They're facing not only a racial issue, but the fact a gender issue as well, so it's a double whammy on, on two sides, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. They face a lot of discrimination. It was not, not an easy task to sort of step out and do that because people really felt like they were going against the Bible. <laughs> you know, it's just, to me, you know, it almost sounds weird to say, but that was really their experience. So there's a verse in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34, which says that women should be silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate. And people latch on to that <laughs> and they run with it. Oh, you know, absolutely. And they think it very, very literally what Paul said in Corinthians. So for these women, for Jarena Lee and Julia Foote and even Zilpha Elaw, who was another early black woman, woman preacher, for them to actually stand up and not just teach Sunday school, not just, you know, lead the women bake sale, but to actually preach in light of a culture that felt that they didn't even have the right to speak in church. I mean, that's a big deal. That's incredible. That's yeah, taking a really courageous stand for on a lot of fronts, certainly, like you say, just as women in general. And in that time period, we're talking, what, nearly two, well, 200 years ago, just about some, in some cases, it's amazing mm-hmm. to have that courage. And, and I think the passion that these women must have had to face all this adversity, just being you know, African American women and women in general preaching in that time period, I, I can't imagine the kind of, uh, adversity they faced. Oh yeah, it's um they they were faced with violence. There's an example in the article um that I gave about a woman who spoke about actually, I mean, being met with actual violence to her body <laughs> for mm. daring to get up to preach. I um, it's, it's hard to believe, but and, it happened. Yeah, it's it's hard to believe, but that was how seriously people felt about women preaching, and so that's why you know. I think it's important to study this time period and to really reach back and understand the origin of all of this, because then you get to see these stories and you understand, wait a minute, people have been fighting against this for 200 years? Yeah, this is not a new still, thing, and it's still going <laughs> still on. still doing it, you know? So it's, um, I think it's important. It's important for women now to know that they aren't alone, that, you know, our grandmothers, great-grandmothers, great-great-grandmothers were fighting these same battles, and there's nothing wrong with fighting that battle. If you go back to the time of the, around the Emancipation Proclamation and the Civil War, does the situation change in any way in general for African Americans? We know, obviously, that the, the Civil War was fought, and then after that, you get into the Jim Crow laws and things. Can you describe for us what, what the context was at that time? especially for African-American women preachers? Were there any that you could find during that time period? There were some. Let me, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to think of some specific situations. But what we see at the time of the Civil War is that black men are finally given the opportunity to be men, however that notion is described or conceptualized. Yeah, and that to a lot of them, being a man, beating your chest, you know, and whatnot, means subjugating women. So, in a really weird way, that period right after the Civil War was really hard for Black American women because 
they were working too. It's not like they were, you know, just sitting at home and the men were working and bringing home the bacon. Like everybody was working. Everybody was struggling to survive. But they were also trying to figure out what it meant to be free people. And they were in a society that said that a man does this and a woman does this. And there was immediate tension because that just doesn't always work, right? Like women are going to say, hey, I'm contributing as well. I'm getting out there and I'm working and I'm cleaning houses as well. So when you're looking at that societal yeah, the stereotypes. Societal shift on a wide scale, when you get down to the church, it's the same thing. The women are the ones raising the money. There's higher attendance rates for women. Like the church is running because of the women, but all the men are saying, hey, hey, ladies. It's our job to preach and lead and get all the attention. That was a really rough time period for black American women because people are just figuring out how to be free people. What does that even look like? And you're taking on these gender stereotypes, cultural stereotypes. Do you still see that in the church today? Those kind of stereotypes? Because I remember talking with Deanna, and we'll get into this next week in our podcast, but she mentioned some of her specific experiences of, she feels like, as you say, even though African-American women in in large part are kind of keeping the churches afloat and keeping things running. It's the men who somehow get to be in charge and get all the important jobs. And she's saying, wait a minute, how how does this work? We need to think about this. We need to question some of these things. You're saying it goes back to sort of the Civil War era and the period that comes out of that? Yes, exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. The issues with discrimination that we're seeing in the church today stem directly to that, all those anxieties that people were feeling after emancipation. I mean, you really had people fighting for the larger society to acknowledge their humanity, just see them as human beings, not animals, not chattel, not monkeys and apes and gorillas, but actual people. And that's not hyperbole. They really thought (laughs) that we were subhuman. So you're in this world where you're trying to get people to recognize your humanity. But then on top of that, you're trying to get people to recognize your manhood and your womanhood, which is a slightly different thing. We are mostly familiar with Sojourner Truth's Ain't I a Woman speech. And she was arguing for that. Like, I don't get treated like a delicate woman the way that white women get to be treated. So. What does that mean? What does that mean in the church? <laughs> like, these are really hard questions that people have been dealing with since the 1860s. Um, this is not a new thing. Because people want to present themselves as respectable, as productive members of society. And black men couldn't have black women running around leading things. You um, couldn't have that then. having society thinking that, you know, y'all are less than men, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I see what you're saying. So what? why is it so important that you have this, you're carrying this torch kind of into what's going on today. If these stereotypes and gender issues and things are still going on, why is it so important in your view that African American women are, are allowed that voice to speak in those leadership roles? What's the church missing out on that's, that these women can bring to the table? Well, I think that at a really, really basic level, the church is just missing out on a lot of wisdom and a lot of perspective from its membership. It, I think a lot of statistics say that most churches are roughly 70% women as far as the membership goes for black American churches. So 70% of your congregation on average is women, but the leadership is like 95% male. You might have one woman sprinkled here or there. You're missing out. You're missing out on perspectives that relate to your membership. You're missing out on different ways of reading and understanding the Bible and understanding Jesus's ministry. And when you're focused so much on trying to keep women in their place, so to speak, all that energy could be devoted to other things. You could be talking about kindness and justice and charity and a dozen other things. (laughs) Yeah. that are more important to society and more useful to your community than women shouldn't be allowed to wear this, or women shouldn't be allowed to do this, and you're a good woman if you do this, but you're a bad woman if you do this. I just think it's a giant waste of time. Yeah, we're certainly not accomplishing much and if we're just spending our time just looking at these other little issues. Something that Deanna, Deanna and I talk about is this issue of African-American women being staying single, and she's quite passionate about that in the church. She feels that A lot of women are being kept in this sort of single role. Her thing was, you know, waiting for my Boaz. That's 
the phrase that she told me the other day. And I thought, you know, this is an interesting thing, isn't it? That you've got all, all these women doing all these important things in these African-American churches. They're not allowed really to preach. They're not allowed to lead. And yet so many of them are kind of looking to the pastor sort of as a vicarious husband in a way. And so she she feels quite passionately about the fact that this is this is an injustice. These women are being kind of kept down in a way and kept single for a long time, waiting for my Boaz, and it hasn't happened. Yes, and I have so much respect for Deanna for all the work that she's doing in that area. And she's right. There is definitely a certain level of... Um, taking advantage, and I would call it abuse. I know some people might get mad at that, but just that's just my opinion. That's your that, take on it. Um, a lot of church organizations take advantage of a lot of women's desperation for wanting to be married and wanting to do it the right way. And I'll just, I have to say, there is not near enough pressure on black men in churches to be, quote-unquote, husband material. There just isn't. There are sermons on sermons and, and videos and there's a whole industry telling women how to be good wives and how to, you know, live a life that, you know, the right man will find you and all the work and the pressures put on the women. And the men can pretty much do what they want. <laughs> you know, they don't get shamed for having premarital sex. You know, they don't get shamed for having children out of wedlock. Generally speaking, you know, of course, some churches are more, um, more egalitarian, more equal, but just, you know, speaking generally, like, you just don't see this aimed at the men. It's aimed at the women. So you tell little girls growing up in these churches from the time they're small, um, you can't be in the pulpit, you can't preach, you have to ask a man for permission for X, Y, Z, um, and then they grow up, and they're women, and they're wanting to be married, and they realize that the men have pretty much been able to do whatever they want. And, you know, what do you do with that? It, yeah. it leads to a really sad situation. And there are lots of single women in the church who are kind of depriving themselves of healthy relationships, depriving themselves of a lot of self-esteem and self-worth because they feel like they're doing something wrong because they're not married. But the men aren't taught that. Yeah, so, so I have a, a big problem with there's that. There's a real, <laughs> there's a definite imbalance there for sure, isn't there? So what's the current, oh, yeah. yeah, what would you say is the current state of women African American preachers? You know, we talked about this the other day that you have a real passion for wanting to hear those voices, even though you're not really necessarily involved in churches anymore like you were in the past. But what, what's, what would you, how would you describe it? Is it, is it changing? Is it getting better? Or is it not changing at all and getting worse? I don't know. What? How would you describe it? I think that it's slowly getting better. There has been a lot of progress since the 1990s. There's still a lot of church, black American churches that don't permit women to preach. But, um, for instance, the AME Church um, had its first female bishop in the year 2000, Bishop McKenzie. Uh, and that was that was so recent. It was just what eighteen years ago. <laughs> yeah, not even that long ago. <laughs> that happened, but it happened. So there's some um, there's definitely some progress being made. You're seeing a lot more uh, women in pulpit. And even though I have definitely distanced myself from you know a lot of churches and organized religion and whatnot, I still think it's important for the women who are in that institution to see themselves equally represented in the leadership. If you have an organization that's 70% women, well then, you know, the, the leadership and the lessons in that institution should reflect that. So that's really what I'm just trying to say. I think that it would be healthier for everyone involved, people in and out of the church, if the sexism was sort of uh, shunned and uh, and yes. gotten away with. Something was done about with, it. I mean. Well, and certainly we know regardless of ethnic background, the, the, the state of the church is certainly in, in America. A lot of people look at it today and, and think what, what's going on there because there's, there's a very little social involvement. We hear a lot of noise from on the political spectrum, for sure, getting involved in politics and the right, the religious right and all this kind of stuff. But where's the social element? And from what I hear you saying, if perhaps women were allowed those roles, then maybe the church would actually be involved in more of the social arena and maybe gain some of its reputation back. As, as I see it, looking at it from across the pond over here, the evangelical church in America is not looking very good right now. 
especially with its association with Donald Trump and the far right politics and all that stuff that's going on. I don't know how, what your perspective on that is, but I know we don't have we don't have to get into politics necessarily. But what do you what do you say to the church, the reputation of the church, just kind of overall? I definitely think that evangelicalism. I always stumble over that word. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> evangelicalism, evangelicalism has taken a beating recently. Definitely. Um, I think they have some some chickens coming home to roost with all of the things that have happened with Donald Trump. Um, a lot of people are really looking at them sideways and saying, hey, like, is this really what you all stand for? Because this does not seem very Christ-like in yeah, any shape, fashion, or form. Yeah, there's a lot of um, racism and think, a lot of things that have been actually revealed that were already there. That's the shocking yes, part exactly. to me, is that the racism and the misogyny and some of the other things that apparently they were there all along. It's just been brought mm-hmm. to light. And as you say, uh, certainly toward the white evangelical church, kind of that hardcore block of 80%, 81% of white evangelical voters that voted for him from the African-American community, it's not looking too good, I, I would have to think. I would agree. I mean, it's definitely not looking good. And I think it's forcing people to think about these definitions and these groups. Um, because for a long time, like evangelical meant a certain thing. In the black community, evangelical, it's not quite the same as what you see, like the TV preachers with the huge churches and things like that. It's not always the same. People, especially younger people, are forcing the church to come to terms with its hypocrisy, forcing the church to come to terms with its sexism and homophobia and anti-intellectualism, as I said before. They're they're having to to answer for that because so many younger people are like I'm I'm not dealing with this. This doesn't reflect my values. It doesn't reflect where I think Jesus stands for. And so I don't want anything to do with it. So there's sort of a lot of traditional churches are in panic mode almost because of all the things that are happening in politics and in the news. And they have to figure out if they want that to be their message and if they want that to represent them. And they're going to have to just, they're going to have to do that hard work. They're really going to have to decide where they're going to stand, which side of the fence they're going to be on. Um, But it's definitely, it's a hot button issue because I think a lot of African Americans still tend to be a bit on the socially conservative side, but they just don't identify with that sort of mainstream white evangelicalism that we're seeing on TV right now. I'm curious to know, what's your advice? I always ask people this question. Let's say that you're, someone's listening to this podcast. Let's say it's a young African American woman who's, you know, wants to preach, who wants to be involved in ministry and has listened to you and said, yeah, Valerie, I, I, I love what you're saying, but the way forward for me, what does it look like? What would your advice be to someone in that scenario going forward? Oh, wow. Um, that's a tough question. I know. Yeah. Not well, an easy because- answer. Of course, you know, sometimes you want to sound all big and bad and revolutionary, right? Leave the church and start your own, you know, do that. But, and I'm totally fine if anybody wants to do that. But I understand that that's easier said than done, right? If your entire family is in the church, um, if that's your support system and whatnot, it's hard to just leave. So I would say, you know, stick to your guns, though. Yeah, don't just um, give up. feel like, you know, you've been called to preach, it's not my place to judge whether that's accurate or not. But if you really feel that you have something to say and you have something to contribute to your church community, I don't think that you should be quiet just because you're a woman. I think that if your church leadership is trying to hold you back and keep you down, you know, whatever twisted logic they like to use, you, should, you keep fighting. And maybe that does mean leaving. Maybe it means staying and perhaps being a pariah. I'm not sure, but I I want people to not just sort of take it. Don't just sit back and be like, oh, well, they said I, I can't preach, so I guess I won't. I guess Don't that's do it, that, then. Because that's how we got to this point. You know, we I think that there is still an opportunity for redemption for the church. I might be a little optimistic. <laughs> I know a lot of people would disagree with that, but I think that there is still a chance for the church to be a really great asset to communities. It doesn't have to be this place where people are silenced and abused and so on and so forth. But it's going to have to be honest with itself. And when when women, when anybody, stands up and says, you know, I want to do this. I want to preach. I want to lead. I have a message. 
they're going to have to learn how to listen to people. That's good advice, but just don't back down. Don't, don't back, back down. down. I mean, everyone's got their own path to walk for sure, don't they? But look at the, look at, for example, this recent March for Our Lives that's been going on all over America. Uh, we have all these kids from, from Parkland High School because of this recent shooting. It, it's a whole generation that's rising up. And the message that I seem to, to see from this generation is, okay, the older generation, you guys aren't getting it done. So we're going to do it. And they're doing it through social media and doing it through Twitter and other platforms, getting their message out there. And they're trying to change the world and they are changing the world. So yeah, you don't have to just take it, do you? You don't have to just lay back and go, well, they said I couldn't do it. So I guess that's it then. I'll just, I won't say a word. Well, young people are changing the world. Yeah. Yeah. And I would love to see like young women and men because believe it or not, <laughs> men can support uh, their female peers in uh, getting into church leadership. Um, I would love to see the youth really come together in the faith community and say, hey, there are just certain things that we are not going to tolerate anymore. Well, we're um, not going to take it That anymore. would be amazing. I don't even know what that would look like. <laughs> but that would be a pretty awesome thing to see. <laughs> Somebody out there is going to get fired up. Well, listen, I'm so glad that we've had this time to chat. Now, I was going to say at the end, we forgot to mention the name of the book and your chapter. If you want to find out more uh, about Valerie's chapter, it's a, it's a collaborative chapter with you and Deanna. Is that right? Yes. It's sort of a two-parter. It's a two-part chapter. Can you tell us the name of the book and, and your chapter? The name of the book is Women Versus Religion, The Case Against Faith and For Freedom. It's edited by Dr. Karen Garth. And my chapter in the book, is called Black Women and Christianity in the United States, A Historical Perspective, Part 1. Part 2 is going to be Deanna's chapter, and you'll hear from her a little bit later. So my portion covers the colonial era to Jim Crow, and then Deanna's portion picks up after that. Right, so we definitely want people to go out and buy Karen's book. Hopefully we're going to get Karen on the podcast as well after Deanna, which is next week. The other thing I was going to ask you too is if people wanted to get a hold of you, is there a way that they can do that on social media? Is there a good way to do it, like Twitter, uh, Instagram? Do you have a Twitter handle? Uh, Yes. So I have a historical consulting business. It's called Linfield Historical. Um, But the easiest way to find me is just go to vcwade.com. That's V as in Victor, C Wade, W-A-D-E, dot com. And you can hunt around for me there. So do you, is that a blog that you run or your, is that your website? It's just a personal website that links to my consulting business and my blog and other things. So, yeah. Right. So if people are interested, in, you can get a hold of Valerie a couple different ways. You can always get a hold of me and I can put you in touch with Valerie too. So listen, this has been great. I've loved this conversation. I love history. So I'm, I'm always interested to learn new things, new perspectives. This has been really, really interesting. I'm so glad that you were able to be on the podcast with me, Valerie. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun, and I'm super excited about your podcast and the book and really kind of contributing to this conversation about women in the church. I'm excited. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that discussion with Valerie Wade. I don't know about you, but I certainly learned a lot myself. I guess I never really understood from that point of view. When you go back to the history of the slave trade, you have this mass migration, really, of large people groups from Africa being forced into slavery in America and other parts of the world, of course. But primarily, she's focusing on the African-American perspective. And what what were they supposed to do? They're trying to preserve their own culture, but they're being introduced to this white man's religion and how that has affected them even through to today. And of course, how that affects African-American women in the church. And we're going to get a bit more into this next week with Deanna Adams too. But I hope you've enjoyed this conversation with Valerie Wade. As I said before, if you want to get a hold of me, you can follow me on Twitter at MindShift2018. You can contact me in a variety of different ways. So take a look in the show notes if you want to contact me and chat about any or all aspects of this episode or any of the other previous podcasts for that matter. 
So I'm going to let you go now. I just want to say make sure to come back next Friday. We're going to talk to Deanna Adams, and we're going to look at the civil rights movement. We're going to look at the modern history of how this relates to African-American women, specifically in the church. We're going to hear her own story, and then we're going to take it on into some of the sociological aspects. So it's an absolutely fascinating discussion with Deanna Adams coming up next week as we dive deeper into this issue of black women and Christianity in the United States. So thanks for joining me and Valerie Wade for this discussion, and I will see you next Friday right here on MindShift Podcast.